night, Trump in Israel, Iran after the deal, and the circus lives on. Circus isn't dead, we're coming. British police responded to reports of explosions at Manchester Arena after an Ariana Grande concert. Authorities tweeted that there are a number of confirmed fatalities and injuries. Turkey has summoned the U.S. ambassador, protesting, quote, aggressive action against Turkish bodyguards in Washington. Last week, while President Erdogan was in D.C., Turkish security got into a violent brawl with protesters who started beating some of them outside the Turkish ambassador's residence. Washington police called it a brutal attack on a peaceful demonstration. Turkey wants the U.S. to conduct a full investigation. The FBI is investigating whether the stabbing of a black college student over the weekend was a hate crime. Sean Urbanski, a student at the University of Maryland, has been charged with first-degree murder in the killing of Richard Collins III, a second lieutenant in the Army who was supposed to graduate from Bowie State University this week. Police say Urbanski is a member of a racist Facebook group called alt Rake Nation. Suffice it to say that it's despicable. It shows extreme bias against women, Latinos, members of the Jewish faith, and especially African Americans. Mississippi Representative Carl Oliver is apologizing today after posting that Louisiana leaders who supported removing Confederate statues, quote, should be lynched. Two other members of the Mississippi legislature liked his post, which he wrote after the last of four Confederate statues was removed in New Orleans on Friday. Oliver has now deleted the post and in his written apology says, quote, in an effort to express my passion for preserving all historical monuments, I acknowledge the word lynched was wrong. I'm very sorry. Former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn has invoked his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination in response to a subpoena from the Senate Intelligence Committee. In his letter to the committee, Flynn cites escalating public frenzy in refusing to turn over records. He also misled Pentagon investigators about his income from Russian companies and contacts with Russian officials when he applied for a top-secret security clearance last year, according to a letter released Monday by the top Democrat on the House Oversight Committee. President Trump arrived today in Israel, the American ally widely reported to be the source of the highly classified intelligence he disclosed to Russian officials earlier in May. Widely reported, that is, until Trump himself confirmed it this morning unintentionally, trying to deny he'd done anything wrong. Just so you understand, I never mentioned the word or the name Israel. Never mentioned it during that conversation. They were all saying I did. So you had another story wrong. Never mentioned the word Israel. But the president didn't let that awkwardness get in the way of his main objective, laying the groundwork for a peace deal between Israel and the Palestinians. I thank the prime minister for his commitment to pursuing the peace process. He's working very hard at it. It's not easy. I've heard it's one of the toughest deals of all, but I have a feeling that we're going to get there eventually. I hope. But the last three U.S. presidents have all tried to broker a deal in the Middle East. And they all failed. I, William Jefferson Clinton, Lusana Bill Clinton may have come the closest. The U.S. had more clout in the Middle East when he took office. And in 1993, he was able to bring together Israel's Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and PLO leader Yasser Arafat, who emerged with a framework for Palestinian self-rule. But by the end of Clinton's second term, the negotiations had devolved into a stalemate over which side would control Jerusalem and Palestinian discontent spiraled into a violent uprising, the second intifada. Enter George W. Bush. My vision is two states living side by side in peace and security. President Bush presented his roadmap for peace, calling for a deal by 2005. But Arafat passed away in 2004, and hardliners swept Palestinian elections soon after. Bush's roadmap collapsed. Bush tried one last time in 2007, 
aiming for a deal before he left office. It never materialized. Defeated, Bush settled for conceptual success. One thing has happened is, is that most people in the Middle East now accept the two-state solution as the best way for peace. Just months into President Barack Obama's first term, Benjamin Netanyahu returned to the prime ministership. And then Obama spoke in Cairo. Israelis must acknowledge that just as Israel's right to exist cannot be denied, neither can Palestine's. The United States does not accept the legitimacy of continued Israeli settlements. Netanyahu wasn't happy about Obama's speech. Tensions between the two men grew, and after a brief halt, construction of settlements in the West Bank began again. Obama left office just after the U.S. abstained from a U.N. vote against the settlements. Netanyahu was furious, blaming the U.S. and calling the move, quote, a shameful anti-Israel ploy. Since taking office, Trump has already hosted Netanyahu and Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas at the White House. But he doesn't seem to fully grasp how complicated this all is. I'm looking at two state and one state, and I like the one that both parties like. I'm very happy with the one that both parties like. Experts laughed at Trump's line, but that naivete may be the president's best hope that only someone so new to the debate can find a solution that works for the veterans. Trump's push for peace is just part of a broader shift in America's approach to the Middle East, and in particular, Iran. In Jerusalem today, Trump railed against the 2015 nuclear deal championed by President Obama. You know, with Iran, Iran should be very grateful to the United States because Iran negotiated a fantastic deal with the previous administration, a deal that is unbelievable from any standpoint. Trump went to great lengths to portray Iran as a fanatic regime bent on holy war with the U.S. and Israel. But on Friday, Iranians voted overwhelmingly to re-elect moderate President Hassan Rouhani, hoping for more engagement with the West, and now that sanctions have been lifted, a long-awaited boost to the Iranian economy. Seb Walker reports from Tehran. Are there any differences with the Dena under the hood? This model, no. This is the car of Iran's post-sanctions era, the Dena Plus. Are there oh, any yeah. other Iranian cars with sunroof? No, no, no. This is the uh, first sunroof yes, in Iran. Features like the sunroof are exciting in this auto market. That's because the sanctions imposed in 2012 limited the parts that manufacturers were able to get into the country. Iran used to be the region's top car-producing nation. And is the navigation system the same? But when sanctions hit the industry, production plunged by almost 40%. They're now back to over a million a year, and they're aiming for 3 million annually by 2025. 30% of those they're hoping to export. The Dena Plus started mass production just a few weeks ago. The man front and center for the cutting of the ribbon, President Hassan Rouhani. Rouhani's policy of re-engagement with the West may not have pleased all Iranians, but it's bringing international business back to the country. At Tehran Stock Exchange, the country's 326 listed companies are doing as well as they have in years. Part of that is foreign investment. برداشته شدن تحریم ها و اینکه شرکت های ما بتونن دوباره ارتباطات بین المللی بگیرن قطعا کمک میکنه که شرکت ها بتونن ظرفیت های تولیدی خودشون و ظرفیت های فروش خودشون رو افزایش بدن. But for ordinary Iranians, there's still no sign of a dramatic change in fortune. The inflation rate is down, but the Iranian real is still weak against the dollar. Shopkeepers in the Grand Bazaar say people just aren't spending money. And the bazaar is not in the whole of the bazaar, for example, Tehran, the size of Uzash, for example, it's just a monastery. The continued lack of access to an international credit card system means tourism revenue still isn't being fully capitalized. But most worrying of all is the job market. اینجا هیچ فقط یه رزومه کاری ازت میگیرن و اطلاعات فردی و بعد فکر کنم بعداً با تماس میگیرن مثلا مورد کاری پیدا شدهش This is an Iranian employment agency. Mehdi Tayebi has been looking for work for nearly a year. He's a college graduate with a degree in engineering. شغل خوب پیدا کردن خیلی سخت. دوست دارم مطابق رشته خودم باشه مکانیک ماشین ابزار اینا. ولی خب چون نیستش مجبور میشی تو رشته های دیگه هم بری دنبال کار بگردی. 
While the unemployment rate nationwide is over 12%, it's more than double that for those under the age of 30. But when Iranians went to the polls on Friday, it was younger voters who helped propel Rouhani to victory. People like Ali Bai and his friends. Some of them are students, some work part-time in the tech industry. <laughs> For Iran. They sat down with us to explain why they still felt Rouhani had the right long-term vision for the future. The general outcome of the drop, uh, sanctions dropping off wasn't obvious in the economy, you know? Uh, people are saying that we, are, we have the same problem that we had before the nuclear deal. So if things are not changing for them, doesn't that mean that the policy is, is wrong? The policy of Rouhani, it's not wrong. It takes more time to show its effects and its outcomes. You should have foreign investment. You have to sell your oil to the foreign countries. In the end, Iranians decided there were enough signs of economic resurgence to justify another four years for the man who helped broker the deal to lift sanctions. For the country's next generation, the hope is that the benefits will filter down soon. In Washington, Congress is preparing for tomorrow's release of the full White House budget proposal. Even though the president is out of town, it's hardly the full-on sales job that usually happens in budget season. And that's because this proposal requires some pretty challenging math. This proposal is a deeply conservative plan that balances the budget in 10 years, even while hiking defense spending and factoring in a big loss in tax revenue thanks to the tax cut package that Trump wants to see passed. The White House proposes to balance the budget, partly through steep cuts to social and welfare programs, but also by making a wildly optimistic assumption about the American economy under Trump, that it will grow by 3% each year. They're saying that cutting taxes and reducing regulations for businesses means they'll have more money to create jobs. That means more workers to pay taxes, which would in theory eventually balance the cuts out. The problem is 3% growth is completely unrealistic and way beyond what any typical economist would forecast. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office estimates the economy will grow by 2.3% in 2017 and 1.8% per year on average over the following decade. I spoke to Hunter Blair, an economist at the liberal-leaning Economic Policy Institute, about why a 3% growth rate would be so hard to hit. He said that higher economic growth requires an increase in productivity, and that's hard to achieve, especially as the population gets older. As we uh, age as a population, we're going to have less people who are working, we'll have more people who are retired, and so that sort of mitigates that side of the equation, adding to productivity growth. So why would someone put out a document with numbers that you can't take seriously? You would put out a document uh, with high growth rates if you wanted to say that you were closing the deficit uh, without taking uh, steps that would actually do that. We've already had this conversation before, back in February when the draft version of this budget was released. And moderate Republicans didn't like it then, so they're probably not going to like it now. It still has no chance of passing in its current form. Trump may be able to ignore the budget rollout well abroad, but the rest of his administration can't. Starting tomorrow, his cabinet secretaries will be called on to defend specific provisions, and Democrats will start using the White House budget as a weapon against the GOP. Today, an advocate for Twitter shareholders asked the company to consider a radical proposal to make the platform a giant co-op owned and run by its users. We want to get users more involved and having them think like owners. It was either a noble idea or a reflection of desperation among the unprofitable company's investors. Noah Colwin has more. 
People who own shares of Twitter are short on returns and long on complaints. $100 of Twitter stock bought when the social network went public in the fall of 2013 are worth just $44 today. So to get the company back on track, a group of investors floated Proposal 4, which asks for Twitter to be community owned and governed by its users. If being cooperatively owned sounds a little weird, it is. The Green Bay Packers are America's most famous community owned entity, but there's no precedent for it in Silicon Valley. Then again, Twitter is a little weird. The company is hemorrhaging money quarter to quarter and has cycled through two CEOs before going back to Jack Dorsey, one of its co-founders. But for the hundreds of millions of people who do use it regularly, it's hard to imagine life without Twitter. That's why some have called it a public utility. Jim McRitchie, a Twitter shareholder and shareholder advocate, supports this proposal and believes it'll increase the value of Twitter stock. When customers are owners, they're more companies are more likely to be in touch with customer needs. I think that users would eventually flock more to Twitter than they would to Facebook and Google if they associated Twitter with democracy and with giving power to the people. McRitchie has a study from the consulting firm McKinsey that backs him up on this, but most of Silicon Valley works the opposite way. Google and Facebook basically operate as dictatorships because uh, even the members of the board, they have really no say. It's the founders that control the board. The board are basically lapdogs, and uh, Twitter is much different. Twitter's leadership issued a statement of opposition to the cooperative proposal. They say that preparing a study on cooperative structure would be a misallocation of resources and a distraction to our board of directors and management. Because most of Twitter's stock is held by institutional investors like hedge funds and private equity firms, this proposal never really had a chance of passing. But the proposal did get support from more than 3% of all shareholders, which, according to McRitchie, means that you can expect to see this idea at next year's meeting, and maybe even at another company. weekend, the Ringling Brothers and Barnum & Bailey Circus ended its 146-year run with a final show in New York. The beginning of the end came a year ago, when the company finally stopped using elephants in its shows. Animal activists celebrated, but attendance plummeted and America's most famous big top folded. But the demise of Ringling Brothers isn't the end of the road for the circus, or the elephants. Small traveling circuses still crisscross the country with their biggest performers in tow. People like tradition. Even if they've never been to see Ringling Brothers, they know the name, and now that's gonna be gone forever. But circus isn't dead. We're coming. My name's John Ringling North II. I was born into the Ringling Brothers Circus, and now I'm lucky enough to be the owner of Kelly Miller Circus. Being around this circus takes me back to when I was a kid. I first appeared in a circus, I was eight, as a clown. His family sold the circus that bears his name in 1967. John Ringling North is now the only member of the Ringling Clan that's still in the business, but he runs the Kelly Miller Circus, which he bought in 2006. I was 66, I said, I probably won't get another shot at this. So I found out how much it cost, I bought it, and I don't regret it. One adult, one child. We open in the first week in March, and we generally close the last week in October. And in between, we travel through 18 states and 10,000 miles. You know, when you're in Hollywood, they do your makeup for you. But we're not in Hollywood, we're in Ohio. Hey. We're a smaller operation. Our demographic is different. We go to small town America. We bring the circus to people's doors. We're easier to go to. We do good with small towns that don't have Walmarts. Children of all ages, John Ringling North II welcomes you to an ageless delight. America's one ring wonder, the Kelly Miller Circus. It takes
takes 18 performers and a crew of 33 to produce each show. Tickets are $8 for kids and $16 for adults. The tent holds just 1,200 people. That's a long way from the crowds of 10,000 that the Ringling Brothers regularly drew. Hold on to your horses. Here come the elephants. I don't think it's a circus without the elephants. The elephants bring both business. She's always wanted to ride an elephant, so we'll see how that goes. And protesters. They generally help business. They get press coverage and people know we're here. I often go out and thank them, which they hate. Animal rights activists may have forced Ringling to drop its main attractions, but the Kelly Miller Circus says its elephants aren't going anywhere. Elephant handler, trainer, caretaker, it's all the same. We're just here to take care of the elephants. This is open to the public. We're not hiding anything. We're still going strong and we want to keep it going as long as we can. Ringling North says his circus isn't always welcome. We had uh, Bridgeton, New Jersey, canceled three weeks ago, they passed a law. You can't bring circus animals. We found another town. Last chance, last call for photographs today. You want to get your picture taken with a Mongolian? I think circus like this will keep going. Yeah, there'll never be another giant three-ring circus, but this side, this, you have a much better chance. That's Vice News Tonight for Monday, May 22nd.